Thank you for downloading from the BBC. For details of our complete range of podcasts and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. This must be one of the windiest places in the world. They string ropes between the streetlights for people to hold on to. But the weather here is nothing compared to what happens farther south. My name is Ana Yaradas and I'm in Punta Arenas on the tip of South America, the gateway to the White Continent, the gateway to Antarctica. I'm interested in the ideas of isolation and confinement, how people who live in these conditions cope with them, how they adapt their lives in order to survive and create a sense of freedom. Some people choose confinement, some don't. Over the next hour we will meet both. We will meet a man who's been to the moon, and a man who was locked up on death row for six years, and a woman who's still trying to cope with the isolation of a prison cell. But we'll start in the Antarctic, on King George Island, a tiny volcanic dot on the map. Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to my house. <laughs> my house is here in Villa Las Estrellas. We live in the Antarctica, you know, and uh, you are very welcome to my house. And how many families live? Uh, for now, one. Just my wife and I. You're going to meet her. She's very nice. And uh, my child, he is, is very nice too. So, um, let's go. Villa Las Estrellas, the town of the stars, has a population of 41. The houses are long and low, prefabricated bungalows. The people who live in them work either at the research station next door or, like Fernando Font, for the Chilean army. And that's my wife. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hola. Hola, Fernando. Nice to meet you. He's one year old. He seems happy to live in Antarctica. Yes, very much. We love yeah, living here. For Carolina and me... Uh, it was a family uh, decision. Yeah, it was a family decision. We always thought to come here and uh, to live in the Antarctica. <laughs> it was like a dream for us because we always, when we got married, about six years now ago, um, we always said that when we have a child, we want to come here and raise him. Here where the place is so quiet and you live in a in an awesome place to raise a kid without all the things that are in the in the city and he can interact with penguins, with whales, he can see snow. My name is Ariel Bustamante. I'm an artist and I work with sound. I'm here in Antarctica because I was selected by my government to develop a project here, research on sound. Mostly at the moment we can hear seagulls. Also, you can hear steps <laughs> and the sea, and always the wind. So it was completely white, no wind. And I was alone by myself, like, listening, kind of worried. And uh, so after a couple of minutes, you just hear atmosphere of silence. It's not hard to get there, to be in a place with complete silence. It's dangerous. We came to this place that was a huge valley of snow. We have this huge cloud that came onto us. I was not able to see anything, just white, just white everywhere. And so you lost, of course, the orientation and I also couldn't hear anything else. And then I got this 
white silence. Of course, that will never be described in my recording. The atmosphere of that whiteness was what complete the, the meaning of silence for me. When you imagine Antarctica, you think about sunshine, snow, icebergs, everything white, uh, blue sky, but actually it's not like that. We are surrounded by dirty snow, we are walking on muddy tracks, uh, it's very wintry and cold. We are the only family here right now because uh, the other families are coming in about one month. First, I, I thought that it's going to be difficult, but... I have the support of Fernando and really my baby takes all my energy <laughs> and all, <the> <laughs> all my time and I don't know, he's a, a little devil. <laughs> he's a very, very happy boy and, and we need to be with him all day and uh, support him and play with him and uh, stimulate him every hour because we're worried about him and we love him a lot. So he's going to be a special boy. <laughs> he came to Antarctic at when he was a baby and it's going to be a, a kid when he, we left this land. Fernando is a helicopter pilot and he and Carolina will stay in the Antarctic for two years. It's unusual for people to live all year round in here with their families. Most of the researchers go home for the winter, but not all. We did a lot of plants to came here, like uh, bears or like ants. We, we collect our food uh, <laughs> for many, many times. We are now still collecting food. Uh, we're preparing for the winter, you know. We have a lot of diapers, a lot of toothpaste, a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, things that you are going to need for two years. So it's... it's we bought 2,500 Diapers. diapers to came here <laughs> that's what i calculate <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that you have to worry before to came here we were in this market and they say do you have triplets or <laughs> or you you have a foundation i don't know <laughs> and and we said no we're just living in the Antarctic. so my name is alex allen and i'm a medical doctor I specialize in infectious diseases, but uh, in 2008, I spent 13 months at Concordia Station, and there I was doing research for the European Space Agency, looking at a number of biological and psychological issues in relation to long-duration deep space missions. So Concordia Station is one of the most isolated research stations on the planet. It's on the high Antarctic plateau at an altitude of about 3,200 meters, and it's 1,000 kilometers inland from the coast. We arrive during the summer, November, December, January, and so forth. And the last plane leaves around uh, early to mid-February. And so up until that point, the station is very busy. You have 50 to 60 people in the station, so it's very lively. There's a lot of noise, and you've got fresh, you know, fresh food, fresh fruit and stuff that's been transported uh, across the continent. And there's kind of regular social gatherings every evening, so it's a lot of fun, and it's, it's very dynamic. Actually, it's, it's, it's very, very good for us to be here. The weather is not a problem. The strong winds are not a problem. Even when they shake the house like an earthquake, because it's like an adventure, a, a really, really good adventure. It, being alone here without other families, it's hard because uh, you don't share your feelings uh, but it's nice, too, because you grow up like a family in a stronger way, you know? And then slowly over the course of about two weeks, numbers kind of dwindle. And you start to become a bit more aware that, well, the time is approaching when you're then going to be on your own, isolated for nine months, no evacuation. And the last plane leaving, I remember it quite distinctly. We were all, all of us apart from one person who was in the, in the radio room, uh, we were all outside and we were all kind of huddled together. And, uh, you know, the engines on the plane start, your heart skips a beat, uh, you get a bunch of snow kicked back in your face, and then the plane kind of 
taxis across to the, to the runway, gets smaller, and then it takes off. And sometimes, if you're lucky, the plane will fly over the station as a kind of goodbye. Um, and then gradually gets smaller and smaller into the distance. And then you're trying to keep focus because you're kind of thinking, wow, hold on a sec, this, no, it's going to come back. They've forgotten something. <laughs> They're going to come back to the station and they've forgotten something. But invariably, it kind of pops and disappears. And then that's when you kind of, it really hits home that, well, you know, this is it. There's no way out. And it was a very kind of silent atmosphere and mood on the station after that. It's tiny space in here. The walls are wooden panelled and there are 12 short wooden pews. Okay, someone just come. Um, Lieutenant Casabon, Diego Casabon uh, from the Chilean Air Force. Right now I'm, I'm the officer on duty of the week who has to check that everything's okay on the base. And what's really interesting about the chapel here is that there's no mass. You don't have to be Catholic to, to come to the chapel. It's just a, a praying center. You're far from your family, you're far from your friends, and you have to have something that you can rely on, that it will help you personally, and that you can uh, take a few minutes and take a little prayer and be alone. Or I think it's really, really important to have this kind of uh, uh, spaces that you can use for this. So you say you need, you need to be isolated in isolation. Exactly, exactly, isolation. That's right. I think the most difficult thing here is taking charge of all the things in the house. I have days that I don't go outside of the house because of the weather, because of, uh, of a lot of things, and I don't see other people. I just see my little boy and the I TV. talk with him, <laughs> and the TV, and, and read, and... And sometimes you need to talk with someone. We are in the Chinese base and we drive to here. It takes like 15 minutes to get here. We are celebrating the Chinese New Year Eve and they invite us and the other neighbors, the other bases, uh, to celebrate with them. We participate in several other uh, celebrations in other bases in other countries, Independence Days uh, and other celebrations like that. And I think that's important because you know uh, other people, other bases, uh, you meet other cultures, and that's very important because you realize that we work for the same goals, you know, and uh, that's nice, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited about that. I think what I noticed the most, and this was about probably about 10, 11 months of being in there, and that was really the um, this lack of sensory stimulation, this kind of sensory monotony, and uh, the lack of change and the lack of unpredictability, relatively speaking. We had a few kind of scenarios that were emergencies. But overall, it's very predictable what happens. And um, I just wanted to feel something different. After being there for 10, 11 months, I wanted to feel something new. I wanted to see something new or hear something new. The hard thing upon is when it comes winter and there's no light here and it's when some people suffer what they call nevado. Nevado is like the word for snow in Spanish and it's when they start to feel depressed, they choose to be isolated and then it's when all the members of the community try to like drag this person away from this depression. In a few weeks time this is going to be very dark because uh, in the winter, we don't have light at all. It's going to be hard, but for me, it was more difficult when I came here, and it was light all the time. It's really important having your own private quarters, not just for sleeping. So they're called sleeping quarters, but you don't just use them for sleep. And uh, people use them as a, as a means of kind of escape from the group. And what's interesting is as the winter progresses and the winter goes on 
people start to become more dependent on their private quarters for uh, for kind of emotional relief and uh, from any group issues that are happening and so on and so forth. And I found that this space that is separate from anyone else, that is yours, because nowhere else on the base is yours. Alex was in a group of 12 on Concordia, two women and ten men, together for 379 days. There was a period, probably about four months in, during the winter, when, you know, the situation had been tense for the group for a few weeks because of various issues. And um, there were a couple of people who were feeling quite anxious and kind of labile, and someone had an emotional outburst. And as part of that emotional outburst, they threw essentially what was a wooden block. Now, that wasn't aimed for me. <laughs> it was aimed for someone else, but it hit me in the face and it cut my lip. Busted my lip open and I needed several stitches to sew my lip back together. And uh, yeah, initially when I got hit in the face, I was angry and stuff, but I got over it very quickly. Within a few minutes, and an hour, whatever, it was, the situation was solved and fixed. He apologized to me and I accepted that apology and that's really the approach you have to take in that place. By the way, a few months later, someone threw a sandal, not aimed for me again, hit me in the nose, same thing. You just got to forgive them. The internet connection is not so fast, but it works. For us, it's very good because five years ago, you don't have internet, you don't have a TV and things like that. So I was talking with a ex-coronel who came here like 10 years ago, and they said to me, Fernando, you are not alone in the Antarctica anymore. You're not, you're not isolated. That's your imagination because you have internet, you have TV, you have everything you need. We, he said, we were isolated. We were in another world just 10 years ago. Well, let's talk about being lonely, being isolated, being insulated, being alone. People don't like to be alone. I think you can take being alone for a, a short period of time, but I think eventually you need companionship. The first person to ever step foot on the moon was uh, Lance Armstrong, or not Lance Armstrong, Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. Gosh, I can't believe I just said that. Okay. Oh yeah, this seems like this is everybody. So, welcome everybody. Welcome to Building 30 North, uh, or as NASA calls it, MOKER 2, or Mission Operations Control Room 2. Everyone please remain seated while the tram is in motion, and Stephen, whenever you're ready, we're all clear. I've been to Antarctica to talk to the most isolated men and women on Earth. But now I want to meet those who have been the farthest, who have been to space. It is with great pride and pleasure that I welcome you on this trip. What makes the Johnson Space Center special is that the elite men and women who go into space work live and train here. My name is Al Worden, Alfred Worden. I was a member of the crew on Apollo 15, which went to the moon back in 1971. On July 26th, we launched and came back on August 7th of 1971. 
It was one of the six lunar landing missions. The two fellows that went with me, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin, landed on the moon, and they drove the first lunar rover, so it was kind of an exceptional flight. Dave and Jim spent three days on the lunar surface, and while they were there, I spent three days by myself in lunar orbit. Went around the moon 75 times. Very, very busy. I probably spent 20 hours a day working. The best time of the flight was when I was behind the moon and I didn't even have to talk to Houston. Uh, I was completely on my own. Number one, I was glad that Dave and Jim went down to the surface I didn't have to listen to Dave anymore. Number two, I was glad when I got around the backside of the moon because I didn't have to listen to Houston anymore for at least a half an hour. And it gave me an opportunity to kind of sit and think about things. Looking out at the rest of the universe out there, watching the Earth rise 75 times around the lunar surface. Um, and that was a pretty amazing part of the flight for me. We just have a very dark room, just recreating how space must be full of stars. And we have in front of us one of the first spacecrafts to go to space as part of the American program. And how would I describe that? It's like a huge fridge you had to get in as an astronaut. You are like in a like small tin can. I see that John Glenn, he was one of the first astronauts to go to space as part of these missions. He said that you don't climb into the Mercury spacecraft, you put it on that it was a coat or a suit. And really it's not something suitable for someone who suffers from claustrophobia. And you had to do it completely alone. But it's really awesome. Baby Lee, Baby Lee, wait there. Awesome. Baby Lee, look at me. Look at me, look at me. When you look at it sitting on a museum floor and you look through the hatch, it looks pretty small. But you have to remember, when you get into space, there's no gravity. So the whole volume inside is available to you to use. And so it becomes quite, quite a different thing. There's quite a bit of room in there, actually. Uh, we had no trouble moving around and doing what we had to do. Um, there is no up or down. I got very comfortable reading all my instruments when I was actually looking at them upside down. The hardest part was learning how to sleep because we, we are such creatures of the way we are and the way we've grown up. I go to bed at night and I lay down on the mattress and I put a cover over me and I put my head on a pillow and I don't think about a thing and I go to sleep. My head stays on that pillow because of gravity. Think what it would be like if you didn't have that gravity acting on your head. And that's the problem we had the first couple of nights is that I would start to go to sleep and then my head would start to wander around because it wasn't being tied down by gravity and it would start to float around and the minute you start moving your inner ear tells you uh oh you got a problem and it wakes you up so it takes it takes a while the first couple of nights to learn how to sleep in that environment and then after that it's so easy uh, when it's time to go to sleep you just say well I think I'll go to sleep and you just curl up in a ball and go to sleep anywhere and you float around Privacy on a flight, yeah, that's an issue. <laughs> uh, what we did uh, to um, kind of mitigate the privacy thing was we all did our own thing and we didn't really interact a lot. Now, there are some things you have to do in flight where privacy is not available um, when you have to go to the bathroom. I mean, that's, that's a very simple thing, but there's no bathroom, there's no toilet on a spacecraft. There are plastic bags, and you have to get used to, you have to dump all of your inhibitions. Let me put it that way. I wore them, spent nine days in space, and the last Apollo mission flew in 1972. The next generation of space travelers had to prepare for much longer periods away from home, isolated from the rest of the world, but at the same time tantalizingly close. We were coming up sort of from southwest to northeast over Central America and into the Caribbean. And that's the most spectacular from a 
spectrum standpoint, piece of the earth. I mean, the color in the water in the Caribbean is really, really dramatic. This deep turquoise, you know, next to deep blues and then the white sand, it's really spectacular. And so we had this, I don't know, it must have been five whole minutes or something. It was really nothing to do with That's super rare, by the way. And so we just were up there talking and gazing, and it was, you know, like you might imagine going out in a field in the middle of the night and looking up at the starlit sky and seeing shooting stars. It was sort of that kind of uh, wonderment, you know, absent-minded wonderment, I would say. My name is Michael Lopez Alegria, and uh, for the last 20 years I've been a NASA astronaut until less than a year ago, at which time I became the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. Michael is part of the post-Apollo generation. He's a veteran of three space shuttle missions and one aboard a Russian Soyuz. In 2006, his fourth and final mission was on the International Space Station. Right now, the ISS is circling over the Earth at about 225 miles or so, and uh, it's going 17,500 miles an hour, so that's about um, one time around the Earth every 90 minutes, so 16 times around the Earth per day. It's been permanently inhabited since 2000. Uh, right now, there's six people up there, and it has been uh, inhabited by an international crew ever since the first day. I spent uh, 215 days total in space and I was always in the company of at least two other people. How did it feel to be so far away from your relatives and your friends? Well, when you think about it, really not that far. At the closest point, you're only about 225 miles away, but what really makes it different is we have many ways of communicating, not not unlike here on Earth, we have email. We could actually pick up the phone and call any fixed uh, phone on Earth via an Internet protocol, much like Skype today. So there really wasn't that much of a feeling of isolation, although it's hard to believe. We would always have breakfast and dinner together. Sometimes we'd have lunch together, sometimes we wouldn't. And there would be uh, entire sort of half work days where I wouldn't see the other two guys when I was on board. I figured I was more of a sprinter than a marathon runner, and I thought that after three or four weeks I was going to be looking for the next ride home. And I was surprised to find that I was very engaged and very interested in what I was doing, and the time flew by. I never thought about, boy, I can't wait for this to end. I mean, really until the last couple of weeks when I knew I was coming home did I start thinking about, well, it's going to be nice to get back to Earth again. But it's really, it's, it wasn't like I really pined for it the whole time I was gone. This is a very different experience than some might think. It's not Antarctica. It's not going to Mars. Um, it's not even going to the moon. I mean, it's literally right next door. You can look out the window and see the Earth any moment of the day, and it's very reassuring. Um, I'm not saying it was a walk in the park, but I think that the ISS sort of six-month duration mission is not among the most challenging from an isolation standpoint. So you think that seeing the Earth is very reassuring, is very important for an astronaut? Yes, I think that it will be incredibly more difficult for the first crew that goes to Mars and looks back at the Earth when they're halfway there and they can't even tell which, which one is the Earth, right? I mean, that's a totally different feeling. Not to mention the fact that when they pick up the phone, the other person won't hear them say hello for you know somewhere between 5 and 30 minutes. Nobody has been to Mars, not yet. But there are six people in the world who have some idea of what that 500-day round trip might be like. We are in the uh, neutral buoyancy facility. This is the place where the uh, extravehicular activities are rehearsed. So the, the European astronauts mostly uh, rehearse these activities before they go uh, to Houston or to Moscow to do um, uh, EVA training. I'm with Diego Rina in Cologne, Germany. He's 29, and he's the new generation of astronaut, the Mars generation. He and five others spent 520 days in a bunker in Moscow, simulating a return trip to the Red Planet. Mars 500 is the first full simulation of a trip to Mars. 
Uh, we did it because it had never been done before. They didn't know what to expect of a crew being enclosed in the in a spacecraft on the ground or in space during such a long time. It had never happened before, so it was a first test, a first step on our trip to Mars. We could not see anything. Uh, there were absolutely no windows there, so we were completely isolated from everything. What will it be that, like that in a real mission to Mars? Uh, in a real mission to Mars you will have windows, but you will get so far from Earth that it will become a small a little dot. And uh, the advantage is that you will have a little bit of sun coming uh, through the windows, but basically you just see black space, so you might as well not have the windows. To, you cannot see much. Tell me how big is the mission of going to Mars? How long does it take? What was the idea? What are the stages of it? When we go, for instance, to the moon, we take just a couple of days to go to the moon and, and come back. It's, it's a short mission, but it's not easy. Going to Mars is uh, several orders of magnitude uh, harder. To get there takes eight months. You need eight months to come back. So they're very, very long missions. I was surprised of how well the body uh, reacted. I slept well in there. I, I had less, uh, you know, here it's harder to sleep because, you have, I don't know, you have the internet, you have uh, distractions. And uh, in there, I mean, you just go to sleep at 12 and you woke up at 8. We became like a machine there a little bit because of the uh, schedule that we had. We had uh, separate rooms, physically separate, but you could hear everything from the first room to the last room. So if there was somebody that dropped a pin to the floor, you could hear it. So <laughs> that was, I mean, everybody went to sleep at the same time, so that was not a, a big issue. And, and in fact, it helped us in the morning because every time that somebody woke up at 8 in the morning when we should be wake up, we didn't even need a, an alarm clock. We would hear that person and we'd all wake up, so that was good in some sense. For the first month of Mars 500, Diego and his colleagues could talk live to Mission Control. After that, they were too far away, and for 14 months they had to rely on text or video messages. It took a long time to get a reply. In the last month, we got live communications again. And um, at the beginning, it was only with mission control, but it felt really good to hear the voice of anybody on the radio. I mean, see, talking live and getting an answer immediately, it felt really, really different. And then at some point, they even invited our families to mission control to talk with us. Coming back, I think that was one of the best moments when I uh, could talk to my mom and to a friend on the, from Mission Control. I, I love that. The last two days I slept very little, uh, just thinking about, I don't know, all the people waiting outside or things like that. Uh, what are you going to do? I mean, it's really exciting just the, those few weeks before the, the opening. And then comes the opening and that, I mean, your heart doesn't stop beating. I can't remember any day in my life when my heart has beaten that hard. The door opened and we came out one by one and we just could see lots of blinding lights. I don't know, all the journalists, all the people waiting for us. It felt like they were not real people, like they were for some seconds or minutes, it felt like they were like mannequins or robots that they could not be real because we had only seen five people in all that time. My family was there, they were waiting for me and I, and I just hugged them and my mom told me don't do this again. <laughs> it was a very, very exciting moment, the month, really the most exciting day in my life. Do you still want to go to Mars? Yeah, absolutely. I, I did one of the hardest parts of going to Mars, so why not doing the fun part too? I know the Guinness Book of World Records says that, you know, loneliest guy ever, you know, because you're so far away and around behind the moon and all that, and that's nonsense, I, you know, whatever. In the first place, that's a temporary condition for us. It's not a lifetime condition. So you can put up with anything for a short period of time. Uh, number two, I was trained to be by myself in the Air Force, 
and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. So that was another thing, and all of those things put together made it made it rather exciting for me. Not lonely and not and not feeling isolated. I didn't feel isolated at all, although that's it's a long ways away. <laughs> Meditation was my escape. Yoga was my escape in prison. I used to look at all the other prisoners getting through their day and most of them would take drugs, uh, crack, heroin, uppers, downers, depressants, antidepressants, whatever they could get hold of just to get through the day. Um, I did it on a concrete floor. I didn't need much. I just needed a little bit of space. Uh, and through that I found peace. I've met people who voluntarily decided to live in confinement and isolation, both in Antarctica and in space. But I also wanted to meet those who didn't have a choice, who were cut off from society, isolated in prison. Dear Tom, got your letter okay? Regarding your comment about the comparison between a monk's cell and a prison cell, I suppose that's true in the sense of the solitude, providing you get a single cell. But if you haven't got the discipline of mind to begin with, you'll find it extremely hard to go deep within yourself. I was once visited by the Buddhist chaplain in prison when it was a control unit and everyone was being opened up for exercise one at a time with officers wearing riot clothing and holding shields. It was a very negative, hostile environment. Lots of anger, hatred and violence. I got sucked into it. That was a letter written by John, he is currently in a Category A high-security prison in Britain. He, like the other prisoners in this program, found escape through meditation. He tried talking to me through my cell door when all the shouting, banging of doors, screaming, abuse, etc. was going on. <laughs> and it was a quiet day too. And he even said that it would drive him mad if he had to stay there. Coming from a Buddhist chaplain, it made me feel better. I went on silences for six, eight months... I just stopped talking to everyone. Jano na me thailem ma. Eh jano ri ba ma bi ma nai ngai jin na aphe. My name is Tay Lin. I was a political prisoner in Burma for six and a half years. Finally I realized that it would be impossible to move from this jail. So I began to think about how to use my time constructively. At first I started composing songs in my head and singing them at night. But the prison authorities told the other prisoners to make a lot of noise to disturb me. So then I had the idea of meditating, which I had never done before. Tay Lin is a 46-year-old artist. In 1998, he was arrested in Burma, accused of political activity. He was a political prisoner. He was sent to serve his sentence on death row. The men there live in single cells. Mm. This is a prison for women, one of five in Sweden. Uh, and we have uh, 65 inmates, female inmates. Close your eyes if you're comfortable to do so. And then find your breathing. Outside, I... Uh, I never thought it would be this hard inside. I never thought that because I, I pray a lot and I meditate a lot and I was in a good mood when I got here. 
But after three hours, I wonder where I happened, where I was, because it was so different. I met Anika in her tiny cell in Istat Prison in Sweden. She's serving a 20-month sentence. From seven to seven, we are alone. We are locked in by uh, seven o'clock. So it's kind of nice to be alone at that time because it's too. From seven in the morning to seven in the evening, it's people, 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 people all the time, and it can be uh, rather tough. Some days it's very um, friendly and calm in here, and some days it can be fighting and uh, struggling and very hard. So it uh, it depends how it is. The most of the people who is in here feels bad. Nobody is happy. Everybody has problems. It was very hard to concentrate. Because your mind is like a monkey, always jumping from one thought to another. The worst thing was the other prisoners. They were very dangerous. Some of them were murderers. Some of them had raped children. The only thing they talked about was crime, and they tried to interrupt me while I was meditating. You go in in yourself. You go in in a separate room in yourself. You concentrate on the breathing, in and out. You breathe in, in your nose, the new energy, and you breathe out with the mouth, the old energy. So you go in in a, in a wakeness, but still not really here. Do you understand? You um, you don't sleep and you don't awake because you are somewhere else and in yourself, in a calm place in yourself. How did the prison authorities react to meditation? At first, the prison guards were relieved when they saw me meditating, but later they got worried. When I did it every day, they didn't understand why I was meditating and thought that I might use it against them in some way. They told other prisoners to disturb me. The worst time was when a prisoner who was mentally disturbed was moved into the next door cell. He became very violent. He would swear loudly and bang on the wall. He urinated and threw his feces out into the corridor. Eventually, the other prisoners could not stand it anymore, and they were planning to kill him. But luckily, the authorities moved him to another cell. Asatoma sat gamaya, tamasoma yuti gamaya, mitroima. I have a bed here and a desk there and a chair. So this is my life in this room. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Namaste. You wonder if my change was gradual or whether some crisis triggered it. My whole life's been a crisis. But I do know once you reach the darkest, deepest part of your being and begin to choke on your own negativity, you either stay there and deteriorate further until you can no longer help yourself, go insane, self-harm, commit suicide, or something instinctively kicks in. And you see a little light and a question burns in your mind. Is that all you've got? Are you going to give in? My name is Nick and I'm a former drug smuggler. When I was uh, a junior, I had the idyllic lifestyle. Um, it was probably every young kid's dream. I skied for England. I had scholarships and sponsorships. By the age of 15, I was living in the Alps full-time. So I'd spend five or six months skiing in the winter, three months on the glacier in the summer. So it was a beautiful lifestyle, yeah, as a kid. Couldn't have asked for more. Um, when I was 18, I was training for some competitions in Maribel, and I had a very bad accident, and I broke my back in two places. Obviously, because of such a, a bad accident at such a young age in competitive skiing, I lost my place in the team. So I came home depressed and lost. 
after losing my identity. I had very little academic education. I then decided to go to the south of France where I lived on the beach like a tramp for about six to eight months. And I literally lived out of the bins or out of the boulangeries, getting next day's bread, um, and just lost all respect for myself. And I wanted to disappear. I wanted anonymity. I got involved in drugs, smoking dope. Um, and it wasn't long before I became fascinated by money. I started working on the big yachts down there, on the big 50, 60 million euro yachts. Got involved in selling drugs in clubs just as a kid. And basically became a tearaway. It was like I was on a self-destruct mission in life. Nick was sent to prison for three years for smuggling cannabis when he was 21. In 2000, he moved to South America with another gang and started dealing with cocaine. After three years of living in Argentina, I earned a lot of money. We invested money or laundered money. We opened a nightclub, we had restaurants, jewelry shops, cars, boats, houses, villas. So we basically built up an empire on drug money. Uh, most of it was laundered in, in Argentina. Eventually, an international police investigation tracked him down. He was arrested in 2004 and Nick was given a 10-year sentence in the Voto jail in Buenos Aires. When I actually arrived to prison, I said to my friend, if there's a hell, we're definitely in it. It was the worst place I'd ever seen in my life. Just the filth, the dirt, the smell, the blood, the, the, the noise of violence, the smell of violence um, was outstanding. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. And I'd come from a very violent world, um, from being involved in cocaine smuggling. So I was accustomed to quite a lot of violence, but it couldn't prepare me quite for what I was to uh, experience inside Divoso. You have to imagine that being so far from home, in a very alien type um, surrounding atmosphere, with very aggressive, violent people that you don't know, you can't speak the language, you don't know their body language, you don't know how these people act. They're not the same as we are in England. Yeah? So everything's different. So you all, all of a sudden you become very institutionalised very quickly. You're completely isolated from the world. You have no visits, you have very few phone calls, and you're surrounded by a foreign tongue. Because ultimately, no matter how many people are around us or how many people are at hand to sort gold, help us, we still stand alone. At the end of the day, when that cell door slams shut, we are alone. And it's easy to be engulfed with self-destructive thoughts. You're literally put into a cell that's probably about a metre wide uh, by two metres long. And it is literally a black box and you just sit there for three to four days waiting for the door to open. You're given a little bit of water and that's it. So yeah, those three or four days uh, of isolation are very, very hard. I think in the end you wear yourself out by thinking, you just fall asleep. And then you wake up in delirious states, not knowing what time of night or day is. You couldn't tell if you were sleeping in the afternoon, night or day. It was like damp on the walls, you could see like the mist as you breathe, it was so cold. No window. It was just a metal door. Um, it was bleak. And that was then when I got into yoga. Gradually, the other prisoners began to notice what I was doing. They said that they wanted to meditate too. I said, why not? It's not hard if you really want to learn. The atmosphere in the prison changed totally. I had never before experienced such peace and calm on death row. A friend of mine wanted to, uh, my co-defendant wanted to buy his girlfriend a book, funnily enough. And a friend of his went and chose a book for him, and it was a book on yoga. So this friend sent my co-defendant the book, and I saw my friend with the book, and I read it. And this book had quite a big impact on me. It was in Spanish, so I took quite a long time to read it and translate it. And I just started to practice some of the positions and the poses, uh, known as asanas, uh, when I was in isolation. And it had quite a profound effect on me. So after playing around with the asanas for about a year to two years, I then got into meditation. The last four years I spent practicing yoga about two or three times a day. 
So in meditation, you, be, you become the observer of the mind. So all day long, we have this dialogue continually going in our head. We have all these characters in our head. You were, you were looking at your thoughts. What were these yes. thoughts like? Horrific. <laughs> yes, they weren't nice. Um, thoughts of my family, thoughts from the past. A lot of stuff comes up about yourself that you don't like. A lot of truths come out. Um, yeah, just take a break then. It sounds like the atmosphere in that row had begun to change. Uh, okay, low and beyond that one. Beyond that one is the the two are the other time. It changed totally. Not all the death row prisoners were meditating, but no one was disturbing us anymore. Eventually, I approached the prison authorities and said, "You know that the other prisoners are meditating with me, don't you?" He said, "Yes, I know." And I said, "The prisoners are not violent anymore. Please, could we keep the cell doors open? I guarantee there won't be any fights." And finally, the prison governor agreed to keep the cell doors open. The prisoner started to visit me. And meditate with me in my cell. I used to spread a blanket on the floor for them to sit on. Before all this, if one cell door was open, all the others had to be locked. The prisoners would have all killed each other as soon as they got the chance. And it was at that point I actually decided to put myself into sort of my own isolation because I didn't want to mix any more with the other criminals. I was fed up with going down onto the wing and listening of. All their stories about future crimes are going to come out, and ones they had committed in the past.、Um, it just began to bore me. So I actually locked myself away for about the last three and a half to four years. I literally go down to the wing, maybe to eat, say hello, play a game of chess every now and then. But I think twenty hours of the day I spent on my own, reading, practicing yoga, and meditating. And it rehabilitated me. You find it in a peace. And you go into a different sort of space and place in your mind. Yoga had a massive, massive transformation in my life. The experience of meditation starts to permeate into your everyday non-meditative experiences until you realise that there is no longer a distinction between the two. Meditation just is, whether you're sat cross-legged, standing. Seated, laying down, watching TV or whatever, the experience just comes upon you. I still meditate, but it's effortless now. I just sit and I disappear, so to speak. The cell is no longer a cell. Prison is no longer a prison. A layer of dust has been wiped away. Best wishes, John. Thanks for listening to this hour of isolation. It was presented by me, Ana Yaradas. The producer was Tim Mansell. The music you heard was composed by Eliza Thompson and Sam Peck. And we thank to Ariel Pustamante. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts, and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com/podcasts.